Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. We are living in unbelievable times. Imagine that we discovered an island with a billion PhDs on it who were willing to work all day long for the cost of power. That would previously have been unimaginable, but I think we will actually see something like that this decade. And that's because we're seeing something like we've never seen before. So how do we take this unbelievable tool of AI and make the theme of the conference a reality, a positive future? Well, if I look back on all disruptions that I've seen in my lifetime, I really feel like this will dwarf anything we've ever seen. While I'm covering these four that impacted me, try and think of the things that you saw in your lifetime where when you saw them, you felt the world will never be the same again. The first one of those for me was when I saw an IBM PC. Came out in 1981. I went down to my computer land store in Pasadena, bought a $5,000 machine with two floppy disks and 256K of RAM, but I really knew nothing would be the same after that. It completely democratized computing. And the next one of those for me was the Netscape product in 1994. Netscape went public in 1995 with 30 million users. Think about how small 30 million users is today. But that was unbelievable that 30 million users could connect with one another. It was a dramatic change. It completely disrupted and democratized communication. Then the iPhone, mobile computing. Each of these things changed the world so dramatically. This now affected billions of people, not just tens of millions of people like the Netscape product. But each of these things completely was a turning point. But now, for me, the last one, the day I saw ChatGPT in November of 2022. Even the simple thing that you could do to just have it spit out a poem or write a theme was so incredible. Even though some people called it a stochastic parrot, it still was very, very impressive. And it's gonna lead to so much more change in just the last few years and in the coming few years than we've ever seen before. The reason these disruptive changes are so big is because whenever the cost of something approaches zero, everything's gonna be dramatically impacted. With the internet, the cost of distribution approached zero. With the cloud, the cost of storage approached zero. And with generative AI, the cost of accessing and maybe even creating knowledge is approaching zero. And that's why it's so transformative. And the rate at which it's happening is staggering too. You've all seen this, but just put some numbers to it. Last year, there was a billion dollars of investment every single day in AI. A billion dollars every day. That's the pace of this revolution. AI is going faster than the internet or personal computers went. Right now, you can see over on the right, the rate of adoption to get to 40% of all people using a product, and it's way, way faster, happening in only two years. And in 2020, 1% of global spending on R&D was for AI. Last year, it was 20%. 20% of all spending on R&D was toward AI. So that's why this adoption rate is so fast and why it's gonna be so transformative. But in what ways will AI impact us? I've broken it down to these three categories with the help of Roy Bahat from Bloomberg. The first category is like looms, which automate a person's work. So how would that relate to AI? Take some repetitive task like data entry. AI could replace that the way a loom replaced knitting or sewing. Slide rules are another thing that advanced human capabilities by making a person faster. How will AI be like that? Well, that will be AI like GitHub, Copilot, helping people code faster because all of a sudden you have this tool by your side that help you like a slide rule did for math computations. But the final category of AI disruptions are like cranes, and those extend what a person can do. A crane allowed humans to do things they couldn't even do before without that power. Well, the AI analogy to that is what AlphaFold did with protein discovery. And there's many, many other things that AI is enabling us to do that a human couldn't even do before. So now going back to the few personal aha moments that I had with AI. The first one I told you was when I saw ChatGPT putting out text that almost fooled me that a human was behind it. But I knew it was just a stochastic parrot, just having lots of statistics on words and putting together sentences that made sense, even if there were hallucinations. But it became much more than that in the last few years. AlphaFold was another example where you could predict every protein with AI. But then I saw something that completely changed my mind. It blew my mind, it was just last month actually. I was giving a presentation at the Fortune Brainstorm AI conference in San Francisco, and I was practicing my talk. So I had recorded my talk, my rehearsal, in Otter, and I had a very crude transcript of it, with, even with mistakes. But I took that entire transcript and just pasted it into ChatGPT and said, can you give me any suggestions on how to improve this talk? And it came back with 10 bullet point lists 
of detailed items that I could do to improve my talk. I have the first two of them there, where they come back and say, the opening provides a good sense of historic disruptive moments, but you need to get to your main point sooner. And I was like, how the heck did it figure that out? How the heck from looking at my text, which it had never seen before, this was not a stochastic parrot anymore. This was doing some analysis of something new that I handed it. And that completely blew my mind. It showed how reasoning was beginning to emerge much more than just probabilities of words. And it's not just me. This is Stephen Johnson, an author, who did the same thing, very similar thing I saw him post this on Twitter, where he said, the best example I've seen of L of M seeming to understand was the experiment that he used, which was he took a manuscript of his book, which was not yet published. So no one had ever seen it before. There's no way ChatGP could have crawled it or anything like that. And he asked it, can you identify some key places where I deliberately withheld information to create suspense for the user? And it found them. So it read this book that it's never seen before, and it understood it the way a human would understand suspense and identify those locations. So it's really, really powerful. Where we're gonna see as this progresses is unbelievable. So how does this do this? Well, neural networks worked. Neural networks, sort of invented 50 years ago, were very, very simple. I'm showing a five-layer neural network right here with a bunch of connections, where you give some input stimulus and some outputs, and you get some weightings, and you build this up. A five-layer neural network can't do very much. And many people abandoned neural networks and didn't think they would work that powerfully until recently when the computing power that could be brought to it was so large that the neural network got bigger. Now, you see this five-layer neural network, and you see the connections, as you add more layers, the connections grow super exponentially. So it's hard to make something that can handle large neural networks, but now we can. So how do you compare this to other forms of brains or thinking? Well, a fruit fly has about a five to 10 layer neural network equivalent. Uh, ChatGPT has 126 layers. So imagine that five layer thing expanded to 126 layers with all the billions of connections that occur when you give it lots of information and have it form those connections it actually does lead to something pretty astonishing. Now, a rat has between 100 and 200 layers. So maybe where we are right now is at the level of a rat. That's where ChatGPT is, which is mind-boggling, actually. But look at where we're going to go. Our brain has approximately 1,000 layers. So dwarfing what ChatGPT can, can do today. But everything is growing exponentially. We're getting more and more compute power. NVIDIA just announced new chips just last week at CES in Las Vegas. It's really, really moving fast. So it's not inconceivable that we'll have multiple thousand layer-like neural networks that can cooperate together and have superhuman-like capability. And I actually think we will have that this decade. So that's an opportunity and a challenge. As you heard from Tristan earlier, there are a lot of challenges when you have that much power. I wanna talk about that. I think that because of this, AI might actually be underhyped. With all the hype that's around it, it might actually be underhyped, but both the good and the bad. I think we'll have AI smarter than Nobel Prize winners this decade. I think we'll have AI, even this year, that can work with your mouse, your screen, your keyboard, and interpret things that you're doing, and feedback, and take actions on your behalf. I think we'll have large AI data centers, which we already have, but they're getting bigger and bigger and more powerful, that will act like a country of geniuses, like that country of PhDs or that island of PhDs I alluded to at the very beginning. But where is the challenge here? Well, every new disruptive technology brings unintended consequences. When radio came out, there was a huge positive of instant mass communication, but there were unintended negative consequences. Propaganda tool for World War I, World War II, broadcasts were used in very negative ways to take advantage of the negative power of radio. Nuclear power, unbelievable energy source, but leads to nuclear weapons, nuclear accidents. There's so many things that, in fact, almost every technology has positives and negatives. Fossil fuels might be one of the biggest ones. It lifted so many people out of poverty. It gives people warmth, comfort, convenience, travel. We're maybe all of, most of us are here because of fossil fuels. But we've had wars over energy resources, climate change, weather disasters. I just flew in from Los Angeles where we've had those horrific fires. The fires happened to happen the identical week that the planet crossed 1.5 degrees C of warming. So it's unbelievable the unintended consequences of fossil fuels. No one thought when people started powering the planet with fossil fuels, that we'd have all these negative consequences as well as the positives. So what about AI? Well, I tried to put together a list of AI consequences in three categories. I listed some of the obvious positives, education and cures and innovation, possibly climate correction, productivity, easing tasks, leisure time. There's many, many positives of AI. I listed some of the negatives, 
copyright theft, misinformation, bias. You heard a lot of these same things from Tristan earlier. I agree with all of the things that he's working on. And then unintended negative consequences, things that you might not even think about, like the rogue AI or pollution that comes from AI, power, the power required for AI, obviously propaganda. But bioweapons and other things that might be accidental, unintended consequences of this powerful AI. So I feel many people are working on the green column. The green column is powered by capitalism. That's gonna get taken care of. I don't think we have to worry about the column on the left. What I think we need to worry about if we wanna have a positive future is worry on the other two columns. So I'm really urging people to look at the other two columns and say, where can you make a contribution that could possibly mitigate the red column in the middle or the yellow column on the right? So I took a look at that list and said, where, I, where could I do something? And I, I focused on one thing, copyright theft. I said, I think I could do something to manage copyright theft. And in fact, this started a year ago a year and a few days ago, the New York Times sued OpenAI, and then I came to DLD in January of last year, and I started thinking about how could we make a system that would be more fair and not have copyright theft, not have shoplifting of content in AI. Human creativity is an unbelievable resource that should not be squandered by AI systems that don't give compensation to the human creativity behind it. And that human creativity takes every form. It could be words from journalism and books, it could be images, animation, movies, music, all of those categories I feel need compensation. So I set out to do something about that. I took a look at the industry problem where generative AI is powerful and unstoppable, but it's stealing content. I really feel it's stealing content from content creators. So I came up with a system I'm calling ProRata, I'll tell you how that one works, that measures the usage of content in AI and then shares revenue 50-50 with the creators who made that content. And I saw this funny tweet on Twitter. Uh, this person wrote, I have been told to stop stealing muffins from the bakery. Unfortunately, it's the only way to keep my lucrative muffin stand in business. Everyone is fine with this. In fact, investors love this because I have no cost. So it's incredible how this was meant as a joke, but this is actually what some of the AI companies are actually saying. If you take a look at some of the quotes on the left here, Mustafa from Microsoft says, everything on the internet is free and I can use it in my AI models. And Sam Altman says, we actually need copyright materials for free to make our business model work. And I just think that's ridiculous. There are many, many businesses that make their business model work. <laughs> Thank you. It is absolutely ridiculous that you have to get something else from free from other people's work to make your business work. And of course, this has led to lawsuits. The New York Times has sued OpenAI. News Corp has sued multiple other companies. Universal Music Group has sued many companies that are stealing music as well. And in fact, it came out, uh, the New York Times ran this article that even the OpenAI researcher who left admitted that they were stealing copyrighted works. So there was no hiding of that. In fact, even this week, it came out, Mark Zuckerberg was brought a whole list of pirated books that, that were stolen on a Russian site, and they brought them to him and they said, should we use these in our llama system? And he said, yes. And he said, but scrub out the copyright information and the ISDN numbers, take that out. So it's just ridiculous that the companies are doing this and getting away with it. And I think this copyright infringement really has to stop. So why is it possible in this area and it's not in the other areas? So I'm covering some other areas where people create content and they are compensated. In the App Store, in the Google Play Store, on Spotify. Spotify took in $16 billion of revenue last year, paid out $12 billion to artists, still is a profitable company and it's a $100 billion market cap. So it's completely possible to pay money to creators and still make a viable business. YouTube, YouTube is a half a trillion dollar company. YouTube started out by pirating copyrighted material and many people gave them takedown notices and it was a cat and mouse game for the first year or two of YouTube's existence. Then YouTube started sharing revenue 50-50 with creators and it exploded. Their business actually got better when they started sharing revenue because that now empowered creators. And YouTube is now a half a trillion dollar business almost double the size of Netflix because they share revenue. Of course, Netflix shares revenue with all of its creators. Apple Music shares revenue with all its creators. So why in all these businesses can you share revenue and not with generative AI? Well, I think the reason is that it's not as easy to count. With Spotify, you can count the streams. With YouTube, you can count the views. With Apple Music, you can count the downloads. Of course, you can count the downloads in the App Store. So we set out to try and figure out a way to count what is being used in generative AI. Now, it's trickier because in generative AI, what you're getting is a remix. You're not getting just one pe person's work. You're getting a compilation of multiple people's work. So we had to come up with a way to unmix it, to be able to take a look at the output of generative AI, whether it's a picture or a movie or animation or text, and break it down into who wrote that first, who came up with those ideas first 
that are in that, in, as components in that answer, and by what percentage? And we came up with a way to do that, and we reached out, and many, many publishers were interested in that. So we started at DLD last year. So this company was actually almost formed at DLD one year ago. We reached out to publishers, and hundreds of publishers agreed to participate in this 50-50 system where their content would be compensated. We've now signed 400 publishers in the first year. And now we're launching a search product called GIST. It's called GIST.ai. It'll be like OpenAI or like Perplexity or like even the, the Gemini answers at the top of Google, but with one critical difference. All of the content that's used in the answers, we've been given explicit permission to use it, and we're sharing revenue 50-50. And you can see in the answer at the top, there's an attribution bar that says this answer is composed 36% from this source, 25% from this source, 15% from this source, and that's how the money is shared because the algorithm figures out exactly who to give credit to and exactly where to share the revenue. So we think that this is very powerful, not only for text, but also for images. The New York Times also showed this example where they asked AI to create some images and it used copyrighted materials throughout that. And we asked Meta to create an image of a, of a masked superhero and it created this image. And you can tell pretty much that there's Spider-Man aspects to it. Our algorithm re, uh, re unmixes it and says, this is 90.3% from Marvel and 6.2% from DC Comics, and that's where the revenue should be shared to those two entities in that exact ratio. So the whole idea of this is to enable fair attribution. We want to give pay-per-use so that people make money every time their content is used. And my, my dream for this would be that we have a planet where anybody with intellectual property in their brain, anybody with an idea, anybody with creativity can create something, register it, and whenever it's used in AI engines, they'll get a check, a royalty check every month for the content that they create. That's really what I'm shooting to, to make happen with this. When you look back on the list of the other things that are on the chart, I'm only tackling that one right now, the copyright infringement of generative AI. But if you look back at that list, there's so much opportunity, and it really is the best time in history for making a positive impact on the world, because almost every aspect of life is gonna be touched by AI, so there's almost every aspect where you can make a difference with it, and your brain power can make that impact. And think back to what happened when the printing press was invented in 1450, and the people who grew up with that when they were 10 and 20 years old were Copernicus and Leonardo and Michelangelo, and even though they didn't write books, they were impacted by the societal change of that printing press. Well, all of us are gonna be impacted by the societal change of AI, and what are the odds that we're alive in this exact decade where that is happening? This is the decade right now, we're all alive, like Leonardo and Copernicus were when the printing press came out. So there's hundreds of ways we can make a positive future with AI. I wanna try and help make that happen. If I can help make that happen in any way, I'd love to work with you. So feel free to reach out to me at any time. Just reach out to me at billaprorata.ai, and I'm happy to send this presentation with you as well, but reach out to me if you have any ideas on how we can minimize the negative impacts of AI, maximize the positive impacts. Thank you very much, you've been a great audience. Thank you.